Okay, good evening, everyone. And welcome to Torah Studies, Parshas Pinchas. And uh, this week, Torah Studies, we're going to focus on the Haftarah of the week. The Haftarah, of course, is the prophets that we read after the reading of the Torah in the synagogue on Shabbos. And <clears throat> this week, we begin uh, the three Haftarot, which is comes in the period of the three weeks of mourning. So, uh, of course, we're now from the 17th of Tammuz until Tisha B'Av. These are considered three weeks of mourning. It is the time when the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, some close to 2,000 years ago, it was destroyed in Tisha B'Av, the 90th of Av, the 17th of Tammuz. They breached the wall of Jerusalem, which led to the destructions three weeks later. But I want to start with a story of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai, the great sage who lived right after the destruction of the Second Temple. And he was, of course, the father of the mother of the Kabbalah, the Zohar. He was teaching the t- mystical parts of the Torah. And he was teaching his son, Rabbi Lazar, about the mystics, the secrets of the Holy Temple. And his son was crying and laughing at the same time. Why? He was laughing. He was happy because his father, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, revealed him such great secrets of what the Holy Temple was all about. It's not just a building that was destroyed and we're crying for it for 2,000 years. He revealed to him the secrets, the depth of what the Holy Temple was about. But he was crying because it, we, they didn't have it. It was after the destruction. Because So once he understood more what the meaning of the Holy Temple is all about, it made him appreciate the depth of it and the importance of it, and therefore understanding even more how it is necessary for us to have it and how sad it is that we don't. But today what we're going to focus on is in the silver lining and realizing that really there is much that we gain from the very beginning of this morning period. Hashem is guiding us through the prophet, the prophets throughout the generation, but even to the very first prophet that prophesied about this destruction, the prophet Yirmiyahu. But this is what we're going to read this, um, this week on his prophecy. And we're going to learn the lesson, how really that you have it in you. Each and every one of us has it in us. Not to be afraid of the darkness and the challenges, but to be able to overcome. And why? Because we have an ashama. We're going to explain this. Now, so as we said, we have the three weeks of the morning. Three weeks of uh, Haftaris, we're going to read about the destruction of the temple. And then, this is from here, from now till Tisha B'Av, the 90th of Av, and then comes seven v- weeks of consolation, comforting, Hashem comfort, comforts us. And, and then the, we, we're getting ready for Rosh Hashanah, for Teshuvah, for repentance. It's coming before you know it. We're almost there. So let's start. Yeah. So talking about the destruction, 
how can we recover from this event if we're not even aware of its magnitude? You have to understand what is the magnitude, what it means that the temple, holy temple was a place where God was there. It was the revelation of godliness throughout the world, throughout the nations. Our sages tell us that if the nations would have known what positive effect they have from the temple, they would stand, they would send their guards to protect the holy temple and not to destroy it. So how can we maintain our spiritual outlook in a world that lacks the divine lighthouse? We're all waiting for this. Beis Amigdash Ashlishi, the third temple, to be rebuilt very soon. How can we remain proud in our Jewish identity without a home base? So here is the, the law about the Aftaira, what we read this in these coming weeks. We generally read a Aftara that relates to the theme of the Torah portion. You know, when, when, uh, why did we read Aftara? We know that during a certain period of time, in the Second Temple, there was a time when the, 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 the government did not allow the Jews to study Torah. So what they did allow is to study the prophets. They, they would read the prophets portions that are related to the weekly Torah portion. So that's what it is usually done. However, now in this period, the portions that we read from the prophets are related not necessarily to the Torah reading, but to the time, which is the time of the morning, the time of the comforting, and so on. Until three weeks before Tisha B'Av. 17 of Thomas. At this point, at that point, the Aftaira follows the time of year. Three readings account the misfortune of the temple's destruction, and seven readings comfort the nation from the tragedy. And then and we have two readings discuss repentance before the high holy days. And we read a selection from Jeremiah for Parshas Pinchas, and another for Parshas Matas, which is next week. And for Parshas Devarim, we read from Isaiah. Okay. Now, so as we said, so this week we begin with the prophet of Jeremiah, Irmiyahu. And we begin from the very first prophecy that Irmiyahu had the prophet Jeremiah had the very first prophecy, <clears throat> and here it is. <clears throat> we're going to read the first few verses of the prophecy that we're reading. This we're going to read this Shabbos, <clears throat> and it says as follows: <clears throat> Excuse me. The words of Yemiyahu, the son of Chilkiah, of the priests who were in Anatot in the land of Benjamin. Yermiyahu was a Kohen. He lived in, the, in that city of the Kohens, of what's called Anatot, to whom the word of God came in the days of Yeshiyahu, the son of Ammon, king of Yehuda, in the 13th year of his reign. And, he, and it was in the days of Yehoyakim, the son of Yeshiyahu, the king of Yehuda, until the end of 11 years of Zitkiyahu, son of Yeshiyahu, the king of Yehuda, until the exile of Jerusalem in the fifth month. And the word of God came to me saying, when I had not yet formed you in, your, in the womb, I knew you. Now pay attention to this because we're going to discuss those things. When I had not yet formed you in the womb, I knew you. And when you had not yet emerged from the womb, I had appointed you. A prophet to the nations, I made you. I said, and I said, says Ermiyahu, Alas, O Lord, God, behold, I know not to speak, for I am but a youth. He was a young man. And God said to me, say not, I am, a youth, I am but a youth, for wherever I send you, you shall go, 
and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Fear them not, for I am with you to save you, says God. <clears throat> okay? So we just read this first few uh, verses, the beginning of the prophet Jeremiah. But we have to keep in mind one thing. When we are reading the Haftarah, which is, as we said, either related to the portion of the week or related to the, the time of the year, we're supposed to read something that is relevant, something that is connected with what we want to imply, uh, with wanna, what we want to teach. What relevance does the beginning have? I mean, after this comes the, the, the prophecy about the destruction of the temple. That I understand. This is what this is what it's all about. Tell us, tell us to telling us telling us about the destruction and uh, encouraging the people to do teshuva to repent, or else the, the destruction is coming. But why mention the whole beginning? I knew you from the, the beginning, from before birth. I sanctified you from before. And he says, No, I was, I'm I'm just about the youth. And I can't. And God says, yes, you can. What, what, is, what are these details important? And here the Rebbe will explain what we learned from this. So this is question number one. Why are these verses relevant to our purpose? For our purpose. Why do we need to know these details? Question number two. What do the words, when you had not yet emerged from the womb, mean? It says, from, from when, uh, it says, when you have not yet emerged from the womb, I sanctified you. What does it mean? Is he sanctified from with, before the womb? What would be wrong if he sanctified him right, right after? Right after he's born. And number three, what, what do the words when I had not yet formed you in the womb, I knew you, me. Again, the, the, he says, before, I, before you emerged from the room, he says, first, I sanctified you. But earlier he said, before you have, in, before you have been formed in the womb, I knew you. So all of this needs explanation, what this means. And this leads us to a discussion of, in general, to understand we have a body and we have a soul. And when we're talking about a body and a soul, we're not, just, we're not only talking about the vivifying soul, the soul that keeps us going, that is, we're not just... Uh, a uh, bones and flesh and bones and blood, but we have a soul, a living soul. In addition to that, we, all, we have also the spiritual soul, the godly soul. We are more than just things that we that we are that can be picked up by X-ray or CAT scan. The awareness of of us as human beings and us as Jews, we have a spiritual soul. And, th and that is a long discussion for another day. And the question we want to focus on first is at what point, at what point does the soul enter the body? At what point does a person become connected with his soul? So there's an interesting Gemara that we're going to learn. Let's share this. Dorash Rab Simloi. Rav Simloi taught a fetus in its mother's womb is comparable to a folded notebook. It rests with its hand on the two sides of its, hand, of its head. 
its arms on its two knees, its, its heels on its two buttocks, and its head rests between its knees. Its mouth is closed and its umbilicus is open. It eats from what its mother eats, and it drinks from what its mother drinks. There are no days more blissful for a person than those days when they are a fetus in the mother's womb. As the verse states, if only I, I were as in the mothers in the in the months of old, as in the days when God watched over me. And from this, the Gemara says that this means, to the, it refers to the days of the pregnancy, when the, when the fetus is in the mother's womb. And the Gemara explains, which are the days that have months but do not have years? You must say that these are the months of gestation. A fetus is then taught the entire Torah. That's, that's what happened. So what do we see from this Talmud? When does the neshama come into the person? If the Talmud concludes that with the fetus is being taught the Torah as it is in his mother's womb, obviously it has a neshama. It has a soul in the mother's womb. The Gemara there also brings another, another point that uh, we, in the beginning of the book of Tanya, the Alter Rebbe brings down, that when the fetus is in the mother's womb, every child, every person is being administered an oath that it should be a tzaddik, not to be a rasha, it should be righteous, not to be wicked, and so on. There's a whole discussion in Tanya. We're not going to go into this right now. But basically from this, we see that this is when the neshama enters, that right, right in the beginning, when it's there, when it's still a fetus. However, we find another interesting Gemara that talks about a discussion and, an, uh, and a disagreement in that thing. And it comes in, in the context of when does a, does a child earn the world to come? And we'll, we'll explain. So the matter is of debate. In Talmud Sanhedrin, we find as follows. It was taught, when does an infant enter the world to come? Rabbi Chia and Rabbi Shimon Bar Rabbi disagree. One said from when they are born and the other said from when they speak. Okay? So one said that when they are born they have the world to enter, the, they receive the world to come and one said from when they speak and we'll explain in a minute. Ravina said from the moment of conception. Rab Nachman Bar Yitzchak said, from circumcision. So you see, you have two Jews, three opinions, so many opinions here. A Tana, Tana is a, is a Tanaic sage. A Tana taught in the name of Rabbi Meir, from the moment the infant says Amen for the first time, that is when he receives share in the world to come. So we need to under, uh, explain over here, number one. When we're talking about the world to come, what are we talking about? When it says, Oilam Abba, Oilam Abba, there is in different contexts explained by different sages and different, uh, that refers to different things. Here, the Talmud talks about Oilam Abba is the world of Tchiyat Amertim, the world of resurrection. So the world of resurrection this is what the discussion is. At what point does the child receive the world to come? Meaning, at what point does the, is the child being resurrected after he dies in the time when Mashiach will come? 
and we see further in the Gemara, the world to come here refers to the era of the resurrection of the dead. And as the Mishnah says, every Jew has a portion in the world to come, as it states, your people, all of them righteous, all of them righteous shall possess the land forever. They are the shoot that I planted, my handiwork to be glorified. Okay? So basically, what we say, if the, the world to come means the world of resurrection, that makes sense that when does a child become worthy to the world to come, meaning as soon as the neshama enters the body, as, sure, as soon as there is a connection with the body. So if we explain that the neshama, as we said in the Gemara, that when the child is in the womb, in the mother's, is a, is a fetus in the mother's womb, is being taught the Torah, and is being administered an oath, then obviously the neshama is already there in the body. So what, what sense does it make to explain the, the other opinions of when the neshama, when, when he says amen, or when the child is born, or when they, and, and all the different, the different opinions that we just explained. If you study Taira, there is a neshama. So what's the problem? So the argument about when the, when the world to come is earth is really an argument as to when the soul enters the body in the first place. And the, and the answer is the differences between what they, the sages explain is because there are different stages of when, how the neshama enters the body. The neshama enters the body, but there's different stages of the, the connection of the soul to the body comes in stages. And we'll explain what that means. So the fetus is endowed with a soul in the womb, but at this early stage, the body and soul, they are not unified yet. As the Rebbe explains, it says when the fetus is in its mother's womb, it has a godly soul, but that soul is not integrated with its body. Even the purely physical life force is not fully revealed and active. That's why, hence, it is sustained by the food of the mother. True entrance of the soul into the body is when the body and soul become unified and integrated. Such that one can see the soul affecting the body. Even once a child is born, the effect of the godly soul is not immediately apparent. Rather, rather it is the animating soul which is synonymous with their physical life force that drives their existence. Only once a baby boy is circumcised does the soul become truly connected and one with the body. The bris mila, God's commandment to, circum to circumcise, physically modifies the body and as such, furthers the connection of the body and the soul to another level. And that is a bit boys. What with, what's with girls? A girl is considered to have been circumcised from birth. That's the Gemara says, Isha keman de mehila damya. A woman is considered circumcised because a woman, to begin with, has more of a spiritual uh, character to, to them. But again, that's a discussion for a different day. But what we see from here is that, the, as the Rebbe says here, there's basically three stages. You have the stage of being the fetus. You have the, 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 the soul enters, but it's not connected. 
yet you have then the birth. The birth makes a stronger connection and the breast comes even stronger. The fetus in the womb, the birth of the baby, and the breast. And, what, and this is the differences, what our sages say, when does the child become uh, into the world to come? It means at what point of connection of the soul to the body does it earn the child really to become one with the soul so that it can be resurrected again? And that's the differences between the soul connecting to the body really also affects in, uh, it's brought down in also in, in actual halacha, in, the, uh, in law regarding the washing of the hands. The Alter Rebbe brings in the Shulchan Aruch, in the Code of Jewish Law. He says, our sages cautioned in the Talmud about the spirit of impurity resting on a person's hands upon the waking saying that it is not removed entirely until they're washed three times alternately. So to explain it first uh, outside, you know, in the morning, when we wake up in the morning, first thing what we do, we say, we put the hands together, we say, we thank you, Hashem, King, the living King, the last thinking, that you return my soul into me with compassion. Your faithfulness is great. Your trustworthiness. And right after this, we wash our hands as the custom what we do. We put, we prepare even a cup with a basin with water, a cup with water with a basin, and we don't even get off our beds and we wash our hand three times consecutively, right, left, right, left, right, left. And the reason why, as the Alter Rebbe explains here, is because that when the person sleeps, the neshama goes out, the soul departs. When the soul departs, there is impurity that is, at, is attracted to the body. And that impurity when you wake up, the soul comes back, goes out, and remains on your hands. And that is why we wash our hands. And al Rebbe, as we're going to read also, al Rebbe says, as it brought down in the Gemara, that one should not touch the, the eyes, the different parts of the person before you wash your hands, because it can, it can cause harm, God forbid, because of the spiritual impurity that rests on your hands. Now, what is interesting is that the children, the younger children, yes, our custom is to teach our children from youth, but really this applies more when you get older, when you understand, certainly when you're bar mitzvah, when you become 13 years old, then you become really obligated in, by, in biblical way. By, by, by the Torah, you become obligated in doing the mitzvahs. So therefore, because you have a holiness in you, more of a holiness, that is why the impurity also is attached to you more. Because wherever there is holiness, the impure forces of the world is attracted to it. Why? Because they are like they're nourishing from the holiness. The impurities of the world they don't have their own independent existence. They exist because they receive vitality from holy sites. So when a, when a holy Jew becomes and enters and be, becomes unholy in a way, he sleeps and the body, his soul goes out and he wakes up and he didn't wash his hands. So there is unholiness there. That is why the impure forces connect, are attracted and attached to it. So let's continue reading inside what Alter Rebbe says here in Shulchan Aruch. They also warned that before washing one, before washing one should not touch their eyes, ears, nose, or mouth. When one sleeps and the holy soul departs, the spirit of impurity takes hold of the body. 
when the soul returns to the body, the spirit of impurity departs from the entire body and remains only on the hands. For this reason, it has it become customary to be lenient with regard to touching of younger children. So the little babies, if they touch, it's not so ter terrible. Who have not reached an educable age with regard to the Torah and its mitzvot, they're not yet obligated in doing all of the Torah mitzvot. This is because the soul enters into the body in a real way. When, when a boy reaches 13 years and one day, and with a girl when she reaches 12. This is why at that time, they are obligated by scriptural law to observe the mitzvot and are considered to be of punishable age. The entry of this holy soul begins at the age at which the, chi at with, at which the child begins training for Torah observance as is obligated by the sages. Now, an earlier phase of this entry begins with the mitzvah of circumcision. Therefore, says concludes the Alter Rebbe, a person who is careful to wash the hands of an infant from the day of circum circumcision onward may rightfully be called holy. So, so basically, what did we say? Again, so an infant has a soul from the time he is circumcised, and washing the hands at the age is therefore a legitimate, a legitimate and holy custom. So again, what do we see from here? Is again the stages of holiness, the stages of the time when the soul enters the body. Now, so the question is, what did we say earlier? We spoke about the neshama, the soul that the, the, that the fetus has. Why does the soul need a fetus? Why does the fetus need a soul? The fetus has a soul for what? To study Torah. As we said, that there is an angel that teaches the entire Torah to the fetus at the time of pregnancy. However, the problem is, and we know, I'm sure some of you know, as the Gemara goes on to say, that the fetus is being taught the whole Torah. Why don't you remember what you learned? Why don't we remember the whole Torah right now? Because there is an angel that comes and gives it a flick and it forgets the entire Torah. So if it forgets the entire Torah, so what's the point of teaching Torah? What is the point of the fetus, the child before it's born, being taught the Torah if it's forgetting everything? What's the purpose of the soul entering the body before a child is born? The Gemara says, once a child enters the world, an angel hits the child on its mouth and causes him to him or her to forget all the Torah that they learned. What is this all about? Why do we need this? So, to understand all of this, we have to go back to our earlier discussion. So we discussed about the effect that the exile has on our life. We live waiting for the Beis Amikdash to be built because with the time of the Beis Amikdash in the time when we had a holy temple, we had a spiritual life. This was the center of our spirituality. Our life had different meaning. Similarly can be said also, the child before is born, when the child is in the mother's womb, the child is like living in utopia. It has everything what it needs. 
gets nourished, gets food, has no worries, no challenges, studies Teira, that gets everything spiritually, physically, everything it has the child before it was born. Once it is born, full with challenges. Before birth versus after birth. Before the person, best days, no worries, no concerns. And after he's born, is full with challenges, both physical challenges, spiritual challenges. And this is when Hashem comes and tells Yirmiyahu, when God comes to Yirmiyahu Yir Hanavi, who is Yirmiyahu? The prophet Jeremiah. Prophet Jeremiah lived in a time of darkness. He himself was one who was outcast. They pushed him away. And he felt he's not capable of doing anything. And right there in the first, in the beginning of this prophecy, Hashem tells him, I want you to know, we begin now a period of exile. A period that apparently it lasted for 2,000 years. Hashem tells him, I want you to know you have the strength because I gave you an Hashem. And the Abba explains, the Medrash says, in the name itself, Yirmiyahu, you can see that he was, the, the, what he represents, the time that he lived, the bitterness, Yirmiyahu has the word ma in it, bitter. Says the Medrash, Lama Nikra Shma Yirmiya. Why was he called Yirmiya, Jeremiah? Because in his time, Jerusalem became a place of destruction. Yirmiya in, in Aramaic is destruction. And the Friedrich Abbe explained, Irmiya, in contrast to the prophet Isaiah, Jeremiah lived in a time of concealment and rejection. That we felt the rejection, we felt the bitterness. And Irmiya, he here, he represents all of us. He's the prophet when Hashem tells him about the bitterness that, that, that we're going in. But he represents the challenges that we all have. The name of Miao also contains the Hebrew word mar, bitter. And this symbolized the portion, the period of time that he experienced. But here Miao told Hashem, I'm unworthy, I'm young, I'm, I'm young and inexperienced. He felt unworthy of accepting the role of the prophet. And in a sense, he was speaking for all of us who relate to this feeling of inadequacy. We feel, are, are, we, are we really up to the challenge? Can we really say that we can do it? And this is the answer that Hashem gives to Irmiyahu. God tells Irmiyahu, remember who you are. I want you to know that your neshama, I created you before you were, I knew I sanctified you before you were born. God responds to Yahu contains the answer to our struggle as well. Remember who you are. Remember the neshama that you have. And we'll go back to the verses that we said over here. And the words of God came to me saying, when I had not yet formed you in the womb, I knew you. And when you had not yet emerged from the womb, I had appointed you a prophet to the nations. I made you. And in a sense, what does it mean? He's talking to all of us. That Hashem knew, knew us. He gives us the neshama. And he wants us also to be a light for the nations. That's what we are.
That means that the neshama came first. Not only it came first in time. Neshama came first, that means it has supremacy. Not only do you have a soul, but your soul has primacy over everything else. And therefore, you can do it. They say, you know, the saying, they say, you're bigger than that, right? You're bigger than that. That's what the Abishta tells us. You are bigger than those challenges. You are bigger than everything. The Neshama, that's why it came first to tell us, to give us the strength. It says, as the Rebbe explains, with the words, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. God is telling you, you have a holy soul, a literal share of God sourced in something far higher and greater than the lowest depth of and concealment. And this is what the al Rebbe explains. This is why the soul is imbued in a person before birth. To tell us that no matter what challenges we face, the soul reigns supreme. And that is why the Torah is taught. That is why Hashem, that the Neshama comes and teaches the Torah. The word Higdashticha, that before I, you were formed, I sanctified you. What is the meaning of sanctified you? Sanctified you is teaching the Torah. And we ask the question, what's the point of teaching the Torah if then we forget the Torah? But we have to understand, what is the Torah? The Torah is not just knowledge that you gain. You study to gain knowledge. Those of you who joined our Tanya lessons, you know, I hear that more than once, that the Torah is Chachmasai Shel HaKadosh Baruch The Torah is God's wisdom. What does it mean, God's wisdom? The Alter Rebbe brings in the Tanya a number of times. He quotes the Rambam, Hu Amada, Hu Ayodea, Hu Ayadua. He is the knower, he is the knowledge, he is the knower, and he is the knowing. That means the wisdom of Hashem is one with God Himself. When the child, the Neshama, is being taught the Torah, it, be, it is being empowered with this knowledge of the godly Torah, God's wisdom, which is connected, is one with God himself. So the Neshama is being pumped with this knowledge of Torah. Now, once you're born, yes, you forget the Torah. You forget the details. You forget the, the fact what you learned. Because otherwise, if you wouldn't forget, you would be just like a robot, like an angel, as we learned in Tanya today. The difference between a soul and an angel. I mentioned the, the, the story of the, that the Rebbe taught. When a person asked the Rebbe, why do we have that many challenges? Why can't I just be with a person like, a, you know, like the angels doing everything what Hashem wants? What, why do you have a Yetzirah? Why do you have such an evil inclination that keeps telling me and pushing me to do the wrong thing? And, and, and the Rebbe answered to this child. They told him, he, this child happened to be a person, uh, um, he used to like uh, painting, was a, like art and paintings. And he asked them, what is the difference between the art, he says, he says a certain a picture, a certain art, piece of art, a painting that a big famous artist made of a nice view and it's sold for millions of dollars. I said, what if you take a, 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 a camera and take a photograph of the same scenery? Will it sell for the same amount? Obviously not. Although the picture is much more uh, precise. It's much more accurate than the painting. And the difference, of course, is because a camera doesn't have challenges. It just takes a camera 
takes a picture of what it is. An artist needs to create something and he has the challenges to make something perfect, to create something perfect. And for that, Hashem makes us forget the Torah. But the fact that we forget the Torah does not take away from the fact that Hashem empowered us by teaching us the Torah. The empowerment is the empowerment of the soul that Hashem says, you come first and I give you the connection, the soul that is one in essence with Hashem. And therefore, you should know that you're able to come and overcome the entire exile and all challenges that comes your way. Let's see how the Alter Rebbe explains this. The reason to teach the fetus all of the Torah is to illuminate it with divine light that inspires love and fear of God. Though transcendent, the Torah he or she has learned will serve to inspire the soul. Still, they must be made to forget the Torah so as to grant the person freedom to choose good over bad. But the soul is impacted deeply by this study and through it gains the power to elevate the body in which it is in integrated. This is inspired by the residue or the scar left by the Torah learning in the womb. And that's what the Rebbe explains. It says, this is the meaning of when you had not yet emerged from the womb, I had appointed you. Not only were you imbued with a holy soul, but you were also sanctified. Already in the womb, you were prepared and empowered for your entrance to the world by studying the entire Torah. That's what Rebbe explains. This is the, the meaning of the Aftarah. This Aftarah reminds us that the infinite power of our divine soul and the light of the Torah that it studied gives us the tools to light up any darkness. It gives, that gives us a whole new understanding of, of the Aftarah. Until now, when you read the Aftar over here, you're saying this is Gimel de Polonusa, the three weeks of, of, of destruction. But look how beautiful the Rebbe looks at the beginning, the introduction of the prophecy of Yermiyahu, which you, you, you would think, what does it have to do with the whole story? And the Rebbe gives us this positive message that for thousands of years, we, know, we, we read it. We read it. But here the Rebbe sheds the light on it and tells us that right there in the beginning of the destruction, Hashem empowered us through the prophet Yermio telling us, you're not a child, you're not a youngster, you have it, you have the neshama, you came first and you have the power to overcome all of the challenges. So let us hope that we should overcome all of our challenges, the challenges the, uh, of individual challenges and the collective challenges, we should be very soon right here, right now, this year, that uh, as we mentioned uh, in, on Shabbos, that this year, the, the beginning of the three weeks begins with the Shabbos and then ends with the Shabbos. 17th of, Sha of Tammuz is on Shabbos, that ninth day of Avos Shabbos, that means that we find the Shabbos brings out the silver lining of everything, the beauty, the, the power of this destruction carries with it. The gullus, the exile carries with it a tremendous power that if we only take it and turn around, just like any challenge that you can turn around, you can, you'll be able to see the light. Let us hope. We should celebrate in the Vesamigdash with Mashiach. Thank you for joining. Any questions?
Now, 